you've concluded that show, you have the opportunity to sign up for a convenient month in the next year or two for another show. Judith was a new partner at the time. Uh, we didn't know each other very well, but uh, we entered into a sizable discussion about hard and soft and all the ramifications of that. Because as you'll see soon, uh, Judith does gorgeous monoprints. Uh, she does fiber work. She spins her own yarn and does a uh, rug hooking. Uh, she works in ceramics. She fuses glass. So she's an experimenter in, in many media. And as we talked about how we deal with what's hard and soft, both the reality of it and the illusion of hard and soft, we decided it'd be interesting to have a show together. And I think you're gonna see that between how we deal with the illusion and the reality of hard and soft, how we deal with color and texture, that these works go together in a surprisingly delightful way. And it just by their juxtaposition, we've had such interesting gallery talks. Hi, Harriet. Hey, hey. Bob. Um, we had about 50 people for opening night. Normally on an opening night, we'd have about yeah. 180 to 200 people. Yeah. Um, we had 20 guests in uh, last Saturday. Judith and I are splitting the Saturday shift. And where we overlap, we're having informal gallery talks with people. And depending on the audience, uh, we might talk very technically about our work. The title Gauntlet of Fire came about because um, we both work with fire. I work with an acetylene torch. Judith works with kilns um, and the, the, the heating ingredients for fusing glass. And we've both kind of run uh, physical and emotional gauntlets in the last two years because of, of health issues, which have challenged us to find the strength in our creative work. And I think you'll see that evidence as you look at, at the work. The series that I'm showing is called Heart Armor. I am a heart armorer. I consider myself a metalsmith rather than a jeweler. I kind of take the jewel out of jewelry. You'll see some jewels, but primarily I'm interested in the form, in the surface, in the diagonal action of forged energy um, and, and the conceptual components that I'm dealing with. Uh, hard Armor started with um, a collecting a couple of milkweed pods. I'm a botanically inspired artist. And those milkweed weed pods inspired two silver forms. I gathered them in South Carolina and flew to Taos, New Mexico, where I was living for on sabbatical for almost a year. So I formed these milkweed pods. I sculpted them in sterling and I collect harmonica players. Uh, I collected <laughs> John Kerry, not the presidential candidate, but the harmonica player. And he was telling me how the love of his life had just walked out on him. And I said to him, quote, you need some hard armor and I'm gonna build it for you. And that was 2000. So I've been working in this series for 20 years. Uh, and I never get tired of it, never do the same thing. The piece that you're seeing on the screen is called Global Hard Armor. Uh, it came about a buddy of ours, my, one of my college, uh, my grad, grad uh, instructor, Jim Paulson, was teaching found object sculpture um, online with us at Common Ground this summer. And I had this globe, it had been in my family forever. And the globe was the globe itself was destroyed, but the stand for the globe was still perfectly fine. So I created this this plump, luscious uh, copper and steel hard armor to fit 
within the globe itself. Um, because uh, this is about healing. This is the poster child. It came about in an unexpected way when you're working in process. I didn't do a single sketch for three months. Every day I spontaneously worked with this metal and the aha experiences abounded. This, uh, the top part of this piece was the negative of another piece. This is roofing copper from a hundred year old, over a hundred year old house in Uniontown where I live. And the friends that own it let me buy this roofing copper that was being replaced on their roof. Um, it was joined by new copper and steel. And uh, after my trip to Greece and Turkey, well before that, ever since I was a kid, I love Greek mythology. The gods and goddesses are so naughty. It's, it's not like a serious religion, you know, it's, although people take it very seriously. So a lot of my pieces are themed about um, Greek gods or goddesses. This one's called Demeter's Veil. Uh, she's a very sexy goddess. She's in charge of fertility of everything on the planet. So as I was doing this piece and adding that little piece of veil, which is of course steel. So again, we're dealing with the hard and soft of it. You've got these hard edges, but they're curvy and they're kind of soft. And this piece is very gently shaped. And it's got this veil, which offers some transparency uh, and also the crenulations of almost a ruffle, even though it's steel. So it's a very feminine piece and one of my favorites in the show. So these pieces of, of heart armor and the shields that go with them are about pulling yourself together during adverse conditions. And ever since February, when I returned from uh, Machu Picchu and Galapagos from Peru and Ecuador, I've been working on this series. All the pieces in this show are new. Here's another one where hard and soft is questionable. I'm working in metal, but uh, Bob Waddell is here. He worked with me to uh, drill and align and pop rivet these pieces together because they're sizable and it was impossible for me to handle the material. Bob's a former student and we've been very good friends for most of our lives. Uh, so this piece, although it's metal, it's copper, it's steel, it's soft. The finish is soft. It's fluid. It's brushed. If I were doing this as a piece of jewelry rather than the architectural adornment that it is, I would call this a Florentine finish, uh, which jewelers use. And again, you see the mesh in the center, very feminizing piece on this goddess sculpture. Uh, at the top, you'll notice that I have used the seam of the copper roof. Um, it's kind of feathery and rustic. Uh, this, is a, this is a law bringer. Uh, as the Greeks expanded during the, the uh, era of Alexander the Great, the Greek culture expanded into the previously Muslim world, into parts of Africa, um, into Central Europe. And as the Greeks did that, smart as they were, they began to assume the characteristics of gods and goddesses in those other cultures and attribute them to their own gods and goddesses. So all of a sudden, Demeter, who was originally the goddess of fertility, became also the goddess of natural law and law. She was called the law bringer which I think is really cool. One of the other things that Judith and I share, and you'll notice this, uh, especially in her monoprints, is flight imagery. And we've talked about this um, because flight imagery can be a symbol of escape or a symbol of confrontation. And 
we use it both ways. This is symbol of confrontation. It's coming at you, steel and copper. The patina is a hundred year old. That's the way copper looks when it's outside. So uh, almost all of this sculpture could be exterior or interior architectural adornment. I do both body and architectural adornment. I think of the Statue of Liberty as architectural adornment for the United States, kind of like Beautiful. an air cuff. Beautiful. Off mm -hmm. the coast of our country. Mm -hmm. Here's another lawbringer. Again, you can see the mesh in the middle. Mm -hmm. The Florentine new copper. Uh, dear friends of mine, Rebecca and Michael Dreyer, run Tri County Roofing and gifted me with a gorgeous, huge piece of roofing copper. So um, I think they'll find that I put that to good use. And as I was working in this series, each pattern is cut individually. No two pieces are identical, although there are several lawbringers. Each one is different. Um, and you can see the dimples where the workers just pulled this gorgeous copper off the roof and threw it on the ground. So I've straightened it out a little bit and cut out the patterns. I have both right-handed and left-handed shears, depending what direction I'm going with, mm -hmm. with the cutting technique. Uh, the Heart Armor series goes from about a half inch to over eight feet. And one of, one of the sculptors that I idolize is Albert Paley. I met him in 1983, the year I bought my house. He then considered himself a jeweler, and now he's one of the best known sculptors in the United States of America, who works enormous scale. We are both metalsmiths. Uh, very interesting. We've continued to discuss that change of scale. It's thrilling to change scale. Um, I had some copper cut for an installation that I did with Gary a couple of years ago. And as it was rolled up, the environment happened to it. And where it got this gorgeous patina on the strips that were previously cut, I couldn't resist making this storm shield for Apollo, one of my favorite gods. Of course, the god of the arts, all the arts, but also the god of healing. And I think healing is a big function of the arts. And my exhibit is all about that. <laughs> no, I work in metal. And uh, I came home one day and found this gorgeous roll of this corrugated turquoise blue. I don't know what it was, but uh, it become Demeter's heart shield here. Uh, Persephone, this is Persephone's heart shield and uh, Demeter's daughter. And again, you see the combination of shiny new metal with aged uh, found metal, which is one of the hallmarks of this series. I don't know if Paul Tooley joined us, but his neighbor uh, bought a larger piece that used this turquoise metal. And it's, it's kind of sad, but also heartwarming that this series has used up most of my hoard of found metal. Mm -hmm. There's oh. jewelry in this show. Um, this is hard armor for the Galapagos. What an amazing place. Uh, my niece and I were so fortunate to go with Overseas Adventures Travels. The Amazonite, which is very distinctive in this piece, this chunky, beautifully cut Amazonite, of course, is from the Amazon, from South America. And that's the color of the water around mm. the Galapagos. And the reason it, the Galapagos needs hard armor is because Right before we went, uh, an oil tanker dropped part of a load Ooh. that could have been catastrophic. And the world just went, oh no. And within four days, every bit of it was cleaned up. It did not reach the shores of the Galapagos. This whole series is based on the fact that the Galapagos is an archipelago and they're volcanic. 
So some of them appear to be, when you look at them from the air, they're like this chain of round islands with like kind of crunchy edges. And each one is a totally unique environment. Um, some of them are white. One of them is red. Santiago, and I don't know whether I included any of the Santiago pieces, is jet black, volcanic black. The rock formations there are absolutely incredible. I encourage you when this settles down. Here's a piece of uh, the Santiago Galapagos hard armor. And on the back of this pendant is the map of the Galapagos. This is a hollow form. This is a very time consuming piece. Um, I designed and handmade the chain just for this series. And I've been asked to teach a workshop on it. It's gonna be very exclusive because it's a unique design with me. Um, and I don't wanna go giving away my patterns. Other metalsmiths could look at this and figure out how it was made, I'm sure. But just the average person would not be able to do that. If I named yeah. the ingredients, that would be a clue. Huh. Um, but some adult uh, continuing education students of mine have asked, and we've become very good friends. So I'm going to do uh, a hard armor chain workshop in December. We don't know how that's going to happen. I'm working on getting Zoom into my studio. Uh, and if anybody can Zoom from their studios, they can take it. Or I might have to actually visit in the parking lot of these students and do a couple demonstrations. We'll see what kind of hybrid uh, that brings. Has Judith joined us yet? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Right there. OK. There so these are some of the smaller heart armor. Uh, these are about three quarters of an inch, and this is a whole set. So you can see brass, copper, silver. I use bronze um, in some of them. And there are six showcases of jewelry in this show. Judith, I introduced our theme of hard versus soft, both as an illusion and as reality. And I was talking to them about how we use um, texture and color and how that works so well together with the things that we do in the show. Oh. Would you like to introduce yourself and talk about a few of your pieces? Judith? Judith? Um, yeah, Judith, you should be able to talk now. Wow. Am I there? You're there. Yes. Yes, you are. Okay, something happened and I have lost the meeting. Um, so I'm there now. You can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you and see you. Okay, good. Um I'm I'm showing a I, I'm just gonna show the three photos of the gallery while you're talking and then um if you can't see me, you won't know what pieces I'm showing, but I can tell you the title of them. Okay. Okay, because something happened and I totally lost the meeting. <laughs> well, this is the shot of your installation on the plinth. Yeah. And the back. Oh. Hang, hang, hang on a second. Yeah, I um I am not seeing anything on the main screen. Huh. Oh. <laughs> so I, let me let me stop sharing for a second. Can you see? Oh, there, can now I can now I can see you. On hey. The, uh, hi. Okay. If you go up to the upper right hand corner, um, it will show um, gallery view, and if you click on that, you should be able to see everybody. Okay, I can see everybody. Okay, and then I was sharing my screen. which I just made go away. I don't know. <laughs> what it is. Now it is showing. <laughs> some... You're gone. Yeah. Hang on a second. You gotta okay. get... Sorry, I must have hit, I must have hit something. Okay, Virginia, you're doing great. Blah, 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 she baby. is, I'm not. <laughs> Judith, I see you. Thank you. Do it this way. 
Judith and Linda. Hi, Linda, I see you. Hi, um, I'm the other Linda. This Linda is amazing. Well, I know that. <laughs> this, this Linda is so, energy source of the universe. So, um, should I just start talking? Sure. Sure. All right. So here I am with a broken thumb. Oh. And just the latest. Press escape or double crit, click to enter, to exit. Yeah, share us all your wisdom. Oh God, I don't know what's going on. Oh, there is my installation. Um, this has been a gauntlet this past year like you wouldn't believe. It started out with my horse falling on me and then my finding out <laughs> that he had a debilitating neurological disease. Oh. And then I had three surgeries for breast cancer and um, radiation and put my horse down and put my dog down. And oh. it's just gone on and on and on. Um, so the fact that I got this show together at all is a major miracle. Yes. Um, I love that when you, if you walk around this show and look at my work, you can see that I am going in 400 different directions at once, which has been my modus operandi my entire life. I love hard, I love soft, I love fiber, I love printmaking. Um, it's I'm a ceramic sculptor. I have I, I have too many ideas in my head for any one person, I think. But I just keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. Um, God, I, I hardly even know what to say. I mean, I'm just... Oh, there, there's one of my favorites. <laughs> Three ravens sitting on a rock. The raven is my spirit animal. And raven appears in, in all of my monoprints in one form or, or another and will continue to appear in my ceramic sculptures from here on out. Um, For the longest time, I and I still am, I'm having a crisis of faith as an artist. I'm not quite sure why I continue to do this thing we call making art, but I keep doing it anyhow. Some of you know the story about Joseph Hirshhorn of the Hirshhorn Museum coming to my, gal to my studio and telling me he was going to help me become a famous young artist. And then two weeks later, he was dead. Um, it's just been a hard road to go. My feeling about giving an artist talk is not so much that I want to talk about my art, but that I want other people to look at it and ask me questions, ask me about my process, um, react to it, of course, buy it, but nobody has enough money to do that anymore. Um, I'm just not verbally very philosophical about it, I guess. I'm more, the process is what's important to me. Oh, there's one of my new faves. That's bird climbing a ladder to safety. Um, this one was a great deal of fun. It took me an amazing amount of time. It's a um, rug hooking that's bigger than life size. 
I really had fun making it. And now I guess it's going to come home and lean up against my fireplace. I, I don't know. I would, I would just rather people, here's a, a rug hooking, talk to the hand. Um, <laughs> I would just rather you looked at my work and you asked me questions. Oh, and, Judith? Yeah. Judith? Yeah. It's Gary. Hi, Judith. Hi, Gary. Well, I, yeah, I really like the prints and, and the fiber pieces. They, they capture that when you talk, how I, I see your, your mental process layering and coming together. And that little teeny tiny uh, swirling around within your mind and trying to find the brass ring and trying to find the words. Those fiber pieces and, and the prints and the layering of the information, they, for me, capture what I know about Judith. I like those a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Very ah. nice. There you go. Good example of the uh, the the uh, organization of information or, or attempt to that's inside of a, a creative brain. Very cool. Good job. Yeah, these are layer upon layer upon layer, and then yeah. eventually I squirt them with water, put a piece of a fibrous, non-woven non fibrous material called Rime on top of them and roll them with a pony roller until the whole image is transferred from a slap clay onto the um, fibrous, non-fibrous paper and here you go. Wow. Well done. Good job. Beautiful. Hi, Judith. This is James. I met you at a FMH Crestwood. I don't know if you remember me. Uh, um, I wish I could see your picture. I that's okay. <laughs> it's okay if you don't. I was, uh, I was cleaning the building. I was cleaning and you and I were in the gallery at FMH Crestwood. And we had a great conversation about art. And you told me you were going to be in a show at Noma. And I just moved back to Maryland. And so I, uh, oh, found... right. I know just who you are. Oh, yes. yes. Of course. He's a cute one. Yes. That's yes, a cute, a cute uh, one. <laughs> uh, so, so, I, so I've been, you know, trying to slowly trying to get my feel for, you know, what kind of art you make. And this is just blowing my mind. This is fantastic. I'm so just delighted to hear you and Linda talk about your process because you're a process artist and you just, you just let it out. And it's, it's inspiring. I'm making art right now. I'm just drawing as you guys talk. And I'm just, just delighted. You really, you really made a connection with me. And I, I appreciate you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank you very much. As I recall, I said, come play in my studio. <laughs> I'd like to know how the raven became your spirit animal, if I could ask, or if that's a personal journey well, question. Well, I'm very into past lives. Um, I have spent a lot of time in the Southwest and the raven found me. Yes. And never let go. I've been out to New Mexico probably 12 times. And oh, there you are. Is that, am I there? <laughs> And Raven found me, and I thought Raven had deserted me, but Raven came back and got me started again. That's fantastic. I, I completely understand what when you're talking about losing your faith as an artist, you know, you would know, you know, you've been making art a long time, and that's something, you know, I went through the MFA experience. I, I've I'm trying to get my creative juices back because I felt like it was a traumatic experience. I think a lot of people feel that way yeah. about graduate school for fine art. And so I'm, I'm here just, just listening and learning to other artists right now and just, just getting, it, it's very inspiring. And I understand the whole, the energy like Linda and you have such great energy together. It's a great like I'm this this Saturday I plan to be there and check it out. Yay. 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 Come between three thirty and four thirty if you can. We'll both be there then. I will. I'll be there at three thirty. That's great. 
I think Lee Newman's going to join us too, Judith. Good. Can't wait. It's fantastic. I'm sorry about your thumb and your horse. Oh, it was <laughs> such a stupid thing. Yeah, I know. I know you've lost a lot of loved, a lot of babies this year, and I got my poodle right here. This is my, Aww. this is my baby. He, he bites so. <laughs> but I, I have, a, I have another dog who's about to pass soon, and I know that's a terrible pain. That's yeah. Anyways, thank you for being here tonight. I'm glad I joined with you guys. I'm I'm glad you came to share with us, and I hope I see you on Saturday. I'm gonna try to make it. All right. I see another hand going up back there. Is that the other Linda? Yes. Jimmy, I was not like honors anything, but I persevered. And it was because of people like this that are on this screen that egged me on to continue my art that I'm still doing it. And every time I think about, oh, I'm not so great, these two ladies and the rest of the people on this screen, they are the people that just say, you just get busy, just go do it. And I've made some of the best pieces I've ever made just because of encouragement. That's great. That's fantastic. It's yeah, all about that. You've got to just keep doing it, even if it's awful. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I love. Yeah. You gotta let the creativity out. Yeah. You gotta let. Jimmy, you gotta in let three months, I did ninety-four heart armors and heart shields. Too I much. was working probably ten to twelve hours a day, ah. mostly six days a week, for three months, uh, in a tent and a building that I call my heart armory. I love that. And for 18 half days, Bob Waddell, a former student of mine, who's also an artist, came to help me with those pieces. And I think we came to the conclusion that this was one of our best summers. In the middle of it, we missed Don and Ellen because Ellen was working on a fantastic mural project about women's suffrage. Um, and Common Ground went digital this summer. So um, Bob and I actually took a, a common ground class together with my college instructor, Jim Paulson, where I made two pieces that are in this show that I've wanted to make for decades based on family relics that I've just kept hanging around. And all of a sudden, boom, in a week, those two pieces came together. The best. So it's pieces. just, you get the energy rolling. You say, okay, I can't travel. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make art. I'm going to make art every day. I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but these are the materials I'm going to use. These are the tools I'm going to use. Mm -hmm. It's going to be anywhere from this big to that big. Yeah. And just let yourself go. Yes. Yes. That's the magic. I consider this per pandemic period a gift of time. Yeah. It, yes. It has been a gift of time and I have used it. You will see when you come to this gallery and that gallery does not contain all the works I've made in this time. I've got another gallery. Linda and I are partners at Off Track Art Gallery in Westminster and the walls are filled with more hard armor and I have another art bin with more hard shields there. <laughs> so it's just been uh, one of my best friends who, who now lives in, in Switzerland knew me when my, when my brother passed I had already signed up for a sabbatical and I was, I was going to give it up and go back to teach. I taught in public school and, and now I teach at McDaniel College uh, metalsmithing. And instead, I went on sabbatical to Taos, New Mexico, and that's where this series was born. It's a good choice. <laughs> yeah, I collect people that work in construction and harmonica players. And out there, I found this guy, um, this construction team that was putting a roof on a beautiful log cabin. And the roof was copper. And that's where my first copper came from, that construction team. Wow. That's, that's it. It's, it's meant to be, yeah. Like, I've spent countless hours talking to the brainstorming 
team. Um, I'm a Rio pro. Rio Grande is a metalsmithing company in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I got to know on a first name basis, a bunch of their troubleshooters, because I'd call up and I'd say, okay, I need to get a red patina on copper. <laughs> and this guy said, oh, I just did some drum covers for this rock band. So you build a sandbox and you put kitty litter in it and you have a big party and tell everybody <laughs> to pee in the box. And <laughs> copper in it and you leave it in the sun for about two weeks Make sure it's not too close to your house that's, that's amazing that's turn that copper red yeah. that's amazing yeah i mean you just find out stuff judith and i are adventurous artists i'd agree i I can pre-plan with the best of them. I can draw with the best of them. But if I know how it's going to turn out, it's like starting an art project. You don't want to read the end of the book before you've read the rest of it, right? I understand completely. I can't, yes. I can't nail myself. I will not. I refuse to nail myself down so that happenstance and reaction to materials, to weather, to my personal makeup on the day that I'm working doesn't have immediate effect on how the thing progresses. And I think Judith is the same way. It's one of the things we share. We are very spontaneous. Um, we have definite tastes and particular colors and tones and intensities, um, combinations of things we layer. You know, we pull previously disparate things together and say, that's it. I didn't know it, but I must have seen it in a past life or a dream because this makes my heart sing. Yeah, you're having conversation with materials. You're, you're, absolutely. You're, the universe is talking through you. It's, yeah, it's, absolutely. That's it's it. Amazing. Hey, Judith, can you? Yeah. I'm curious, because um, I, I know that you, like me, work in so many different things do you find it easier to have multiple materials to speak with when things are when you're when you're struggling with artistic stuff if you you know do you find that it's if it's not working with the ceramics that it's nice to have the glass to go to or um you know or the fiber that kind of thing that's a really good question um because i think I think, as I'm, I'm sure I've said to you and I, I've said to other people in the gallery, I think the not too far distant future, I'm going to give up ceramics altogether. Mm -hmm. It's getting to be a physically difficult material to manage. Mm -hmm. And I'm not enjoying it as much as I did. 10 years ago. I get that. I totally get that. The glass, I adore. Mm -hmm. I just adore. Um, looking through a piece of glass, a fused glass. Now, I'm not talking um, stained glass. I'm talking fused glass. I find to be a joyful experience. Mm -hmm. And my fiber work is something I can do in bed. <laughs> exactly. How useful is that? <laughs> well, and you know, no, that actually brings up another point, you know, because for me, I don't do a lot of welding in the summer simply because it is so damn hot and I don't like heat. And even if the air conditioning is on in the studio, I'm still, you know, drenched and stuff. So I enjoy having, you know, whether it's the textile work or the photography or whatever, so that it can, those can take over in different seasons. So sometimes, yeah. it, sometimes it's not just what inspires you, but also the time of year and, and that mm -hmm. kind of, and time of day, you know, like you say, you can work in, in bed with the textiles. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I'm saving my pun my pennies right now for glass fusing kiln, and once I get it, I think clay will become kind of a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. hmm. And oh, by the way, for those of you who haven't seen the show, some of her glass pieces are in the show as well. 
um, they're just not in the Google gallery, but um, they are definitely um, in front of the window and they're beautiful. Any other questions? Any other discussions? Can you show the last piece, the tribute to Frida Kahlo? Yep. Uh. Theoretically, I can. Why, why do I keep uh, disappearing Safari? Ah, I see. Uh, hang on a second. Mm. There it is. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. So this is the third one in a series uh, about Frida Kahlo, um, and it's reversible. The back uh, is a little hard to look at because it looks like her fractured spine. Oh. Uh, this is a tribute, and it has <coughs> probably eight to 10 different kinds of pearls in it, along with apricot coral. Wow. You'll notice some peachy colors and some fuchsia colors in, in a lot of Judas prints, and also this very frothy texture, which I think you can see in this mussy combination of pearls and their little wiggly things there. Um, one of the textures that kind of overlaps in our work with me, it's the reticulation in Judith. It's how she puts those colors on the monoprint. It gives it that frothy, you can see through part and some of it's blocked. We were talking uh, at the beginning of this conversation about a show um, highlighting Frida and Diego's work. It's open, it's now at the Denver Museum Ooh. Carrie hopes to see it. A buddy of mine in Boulder, Carrie Wilson, the Red Rooster, hopes to see it. And it's supposed to come back to the Chicago Art Institute next summer. Um, this, this is the only one that's not owned. When I started this series, although it's extremely time consuming to do something like this, so, and the value of the materials is a major part of the cost in addition to my time and the creativity of my design. A buddy of mine says, well, I really hope you like that because you're probably going to have it a long time. I sold it in three weeks. <laughs> the second one um, sold to the, the tallest cheerleader on my high school cheerleading squad. Of course, I was on the end, 60 inches. <laughs> <laughs> and people say, talking about scale, because Judith and I both change scale in our work. Um, uh, the, um, the, the scale of the pearls goes from two millimeter to something like 12 millimeter. So there's a huge array of sizes of ingredients in, in this piece as there are in some of the others. And this is in the, the tower at the back of one of the six cases of jewelry at this show. If you haven't had a chance to see it, we hope you can come by on a Saturday when Judith and I are both there. And I'm gallery sitting on the 29th. If any of these pieces are sold, um, the big pieces, of course, aren't cash and carry. They'll stay till the 29th. And uh, the collectors can come in and pick up their pieces on that day when I'm in, in the gallery. Awesome. Are there other questions? What's next for everybody? For Judith and Linda, what's next? <clears throat> Judith, Judith suggested we apply for a show at Strathmore. We're looking for some other galleries because we're so pleased with the way this show hangs together. We'd like to move it. Hey, yeah. Chris, find us a place to show in York. Sure. Problem is right now is getting people into the shows. We've got shows right, up. I know. And nobody shows up. Right. It's but most galleries are booking like a year out. So if you've got a good place, give us the connection so we can apply. Mm. We got the photographs, we got the work. Um, photographs look great. 
there's a show that Susan McDaniels is trying to get. Um, I don't know if it's when it's going to happen because of this whole thing, but she's trying to put together a show where, where in all the galleries in town, they'll have fiber optic, f fiber um, art. Oh, that'd and be cool. I'm, I'm thinking that's going to be a really great show if that, if that comes to pass. Uh, Clifton, so. where's that going to be? York. York, Pennsylvania. Oh. Cliffs of Wood Actually, when you're talking about about um, your your approach to to the artwork, and Linda, you made the comment about uh, how how the piece just kind of happens, and for me, and I imagine for Tom as well, it's like you, when you start carving into a piece of wood, you pretty much have an idea where you're going. <laughs> if you don't, it's not going to work out too well. <laughs> Yeah, it was that way when I was carving stone and carving wood. But the assemblage aspect and the One. mixture of techniques that I use in jewelry allow me to be a lot more spontaneous. And I find as I age, I have to have that. One of the things uh, for years at, down at the university, uh, two doors over from my office, there was a professor there who we had this constant conversation about um, creativity and where it came from and how it, how it comes about. And, and we had this constant argument. And one of the things that it made me realize was that some of the sometimes you would come up with something, you say, where did that come from? And it, I could go back through a sketchbook and find, you know, a 15-year-old sketchbook where I'd sketched something and mm -hmm. said, nah, nah, and then it shows up in a piece years later. Yes. And I wonder how much of, you know, world experience and things that you've seen doesn't show up in your artwork that you're just not necessarily making the connection. And it seems kind of like this creativity just kind of pops in there. But if you really analyze it, you find that it's... I think that's yeah, so it's, it's a long process. Yeah, I think that's really true, actually. You know, people say to me, you know, like when I went to Namibia, oh, you're going to get so much inspiration for your animals. And I'm like, no, I mean, yes, but no. I mean, I'm going to get inspiration for being somewhere that I've never been before, to feel the air, to hear the sounds, to smell the smells. It's so much more than just seeing a giraffe in person. You know, it is... It is the experience of it, but I don't know when that will show up in my artwork. Someday it will show up, you know. It might show up in a way you never expected. Exactly. Whether it's through pattern, whether it's through, you know, space or whatever. So yeah, I think you're I think you're totally right. My friend Mira Lerda, uh, Italian uh, mixed media artist said creativity came out of chaos. And all of his later work was called the chaos theory. Uh, and I, I think some of, some of that is true. We are always trying to make some kind of personal sense out of the chaos around us. And baby, this year it is true. You know, as we are trying to grok that old psychological word grok, what in the world is going on we have to find some verity some stability some expression that's personally gratifying and meaningful uh, out of chaos so this um, show have is you, my response to that yeah the thing with chaos though if you if you actually study it you'll discover that even chaos has a pattern to it. And that's one of, one of my friends spent a great deal of time really looking into that. And it was like, oh yeah, you know, what seems like chaos, if you see the full picture, you go, there, there's actually a pattern to it. It's like Fibonacci's formula. If you look at just a portion of it, it looks like cra total craziness. But if you step it, it, far enough back from it, that's, that's the nice thing with computer programming. You can create chaos and then pull back and you go, whoa, there is a pattern there. Hmm. Well, the universe is a great example of that. Yeah, yeah. Fractals. Yeah, yeah. Fractals. Even, even flames and fire, you can see the pattern of after a while. It might look like chaos, but there is a certain, a certain pattern to it. 
I always like it when the weathermen are saying, and here's the course of this storm. Oops, it just moved 50 miles to the west. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My favorite weather man was, was uh, um, oh, I can't remember his name now, from, from Baltimore. We, we get the weather up here from York. We still get that. Bob Turk? Not Bob Turk. Um, uh, Tom Tasselmeyer? No, no. What I loved <laughs> no, about him was there was one day where there was one of these storms coming in, and you know how they, 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 he just says, I don't know. And I said, you are now my weatherman, because <laughs> you <laughs> finally admitted what all of them got to the point where they said, you just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> well, if there are no more questions or comments, um, I think it's, uh, we've been going for about an hour or so. Um, not that I want to cut this short by any means. You all are having a great conversation, but I just thought I would check in and see if there was anything else that people wanted to mention. Um, I, I applaud both Judith and Linda for this show. I think it's a wonderful combination. Uh, a lot of a lot of spirit, a lot of um, energy, and um, yeah, it's a good show. So glad to meet you guys. I look forward to seeing you, John, if you can make it this weekend. I'm going to try. Yeah, I am. <laughs> Great talk, guys.